Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today is uh, day 20 of the uh, ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war, and uh, a lot of folks uh, going into this uh, this terrible conflict, uh, including uh, some, some rather high-ranking generals inside the United States, uh, did not believe that the uh, conflict would last uh, 20 days. Uh, in fact, a lot of high-ranking generals, in, including uh, some of, of the uh, most uh, highest-ranking U.S. generals and analysts uh, had believed that Kiev would fall within uh, three to four days, and in some cases uh, uh, around 70 hours post-Russian invasion. And again, obviously that has, uh, that has not taken place. Uh, what we're also hearing now coming out of, again, a lot of uh, military analysts, which I believe are also incorrect in terms of these, these statements that, that are being made, reference the competency of the Russian military. A lot of is is being talked about, especially in Western media, as of uh, in terms of the lack of competency, the lack of capability in the Russian military that we are seeing uh, in this ongoing conflict. And uh, not much credit is being given to uh, the Ukrainian military. And I think uh, the uh, the Western uh, mil- the Western uh, analysts. Are, are really doing the Ukrainian military a uh, injustice by uh, by continuing to uh, lab- label uh, Russian military efforts as incompetent, lacking logistics, and obviously there are challenges within the Russian military. But again, what we're seeing uh, within the context of this conflict is two uh, industrial powers fighting each other. Again, Ukraine, 40 million people, 40 plus million people, a country uh, uh, almost the size of, uh, of Texas with, with a, a higher population and, and, and a much greater industrial capacity uh, that exists inside the Ukraine. And I think uh, in terms of the Western world, they, have, they had become used uh, to conflicts such as uh, what we've seen in Iraq, and again, you cannot compare and contrast. You can compare and contrast what happened in Iraq, but, but again, you cannot compare and uh, articulate that the two forces are relative. The Iraqi military uh, that the United States fought in 2003 and 1991. Is a far different entity than what the Russians are currently engaged in inside of Ukraine. Not only that, uh, again, uh, we are seeing a lot of Western assistance uh, inside of Ukraine in terms of direct military support. And uh, yes, we are seeing a lot of overt support, and then we're also seeing covert support as well. Uh, you can almost guarantee there are special operations forces from the West, especially from intelligence agencies, that are actively operating on the ground inside of Ukraine. And then obviously compounding that, the intelligence sharing missions that are ongoing with Ukraine and the direct uh, supplies in terms of some very advanced Western equipment. I mean, just imagine if the uh, Iraqi military would have received direct res- support from the EU in terms of uh, uh, intelligence, in terms of direct uh, military support, in terms of some more advanced anti-tank guided weapon systems being shipped into Iraq via Turkey. So I think if you compare and contrast that, the situation inside of Iraq may have looked a little different in terms of the number of casualties uh, being sustained by the U.S. forces as it moved in. But again, uh, the big issue with this is the capabilities between the two forces. Uh, the Ukrainian military is a much different force than when the uh, Russians initially launched operations in 2014. Uh, fast forward to 2022, that Ukrainian forces had the opportunity to train uh, with uh, several uh, NATO nations, uh, including Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, in a in a uh, variety 
of uh, combat arms specialties in terms of uh, the sharing of, of knowledge. Uh, furthermore, the Ukrainians have had years of uh, dealing with uh, Russian tactics and actual Russian special operations forces and regular Russian military that were operating in Luhansk and uh, Donetsk uh, region as well. So again, I think too much is being looked at in terms of uh, the, uh, the lack of competence in terms of the Russian military uh, versus what probably is actually happening on the ground, and that is you're, you're, you're probably seeing a fairly capable uh, Ukrainian force that is willing to fight and continues to fight uh, as this conflict uh, continues. Now, are the Ukrainians going to uh, be able to uh, continue to weather the uh, the type of artillery and tactical aviation that is being directed against it? Very hard to say. Uh, probability not. But again, we're just uh, it's again too early in this conflict uh, to declare a, a winner. And I think going into this conflict. We were probably, uh, again, uh, really kind of disregarding the Ukrainian capability and really kind of hyping up the Russian capability uh, when, in fact, these two forces are probably, again, uh, I, I don't want to say the same, but both are very, very capable forces. And then compounding that, again, is the fact that uh, Western nations are directly supporting the Ukrainian military, and that is that that is a, a very very big issue, and, and a concerning issue, considering that uh, we could see the conflict uh, in fact uh, in spread at uh, at some point, and uh, that's the big concern right now. Uh, we continue to hear about uh, this possible uh, no fly zone. We continue to hear about the possible escalation and deployment of chemical weapons, really on both sides. Uh, NATO is, is saying that uh, Russia could be posturing for a chemical and or tactical weapons, uh, nuclear weapons attack. And at the same time, uh, which is very concerning as well, the Russian military is, uh, is stating that it believes that uh, Ukraine could be uh, getting ready for some sort of a, a chemical and or biological attack against Russian forces as well. So again, this could really just spiral out of control, and uh, and just and, and kind of uh, reach a, a unprecedented level uh, before we all uh, know what's what's happening. Uh, in terms of the possibility of a no-fly zone, again, uh, NATO is not posture to uh, conduct that sort of operation. Uh, we would have to see a uh, a significant uptick in military deployments by both the United States and other Western nations uh, towards uh, some of those borders with uh, the Ukraine and, uh, and, and Belarus, and then obviously the possible shoring up of uh, the, uh, the Baltics as well. Uh, the, the Baltic nations, specifically Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, are very exposed right now. And uh, in fact, you have a nation uh, in terms of Estonia, who doesn't even have an air force, being one of the uh, leading, most vocal voices for a no-fly zone over uh, Ukraine. And I would say that uh, Estonia should be very, very careful in its rhetoric considering uh, where it sits uh, <laughs> in, in terms of its, uh, its fairly long border with uh, the Russian Federation. And I can, I can guarantee you this, that uh, any military move by Russia into the Baltics would not see the type of resistance that uh, the Russians are facing right now inside of Ukraine. The Ukrainian military and uh, the ability of the Ukrainian military to supply its forces and resist Russian forces is far greater than what those Baltic states would have the ability uh, to do. So again, uh, if, the, if the Russians made a move into the Baltics, we probably would not see the type of ongoing heavy resistance and uh, capabilities to fight the Russians as we are seeing uh, in terms of uh, what we're seeing from the Ukrainians. Right now, uh, the level of resistance that we're seeing from the Ukrainians would quite possibly be on par 
uh, if the Russians made a move against Poland. And again, I, I understand the uh, right now there is a there's an appearance of NATO unity in terms of what's happening in Ukraine right now. But again, I believe the minute uh, Russia would uh, to enter the Baltic states, you would see that alliance start to fall apart very quickly because there would not be uh, the committal of forces under Article 5 uh, as specified. Uh, we continue to hear about Joe Biden say that they will protect, we will protect, the United States will protect every inch of NATO territory. They do not have the capability to do that, especially in the Baltics. If the Russians move into the Baltics en masse, it's checkmate. You'll see things change very, very quickly in terms of the rhetoric you're hearing out of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Talk is cheap, and again, I think that's what you're hearing right now in terms of uh, some of this uh, overt support for a no-fly zone inside of Ukraine. The minute uh, NATO states start taking casualties or the threat of direct Russian attack against these NATO states and cutting off that that precious uh, fuel to Western Europe would would change the status quo in a heartbeat. And I don't think people really understand that as of yet, but they may find out here at some point. But again, right now, uh, we, we do see this conflict continuing. We're starting to see the Russians uh, employ uh, much more kinetic force, especially near Kiev. Uh, we're starting to see the use and widespread use of heavy artillery in residential areas. Now, again, the Russians have not started carpet bombing. They have not start started really using all the forces in their toolkit that they could use uh, in this conflict that could that really just could get very very nasty in terms of what you are seeing on your screen. But again, uh, not a lot has changed, obviously, within the context of this map. The red areas are controlled by Russia. The, the mixed areas are current areas where fighting is taking place. And then obviously the blue areas are under uh, uh, Ukrainian control. Uh, but again, not a lot, of, a lot of movement on the battlefield uh, as, again, the Russians continue to position. The Ukrainians continue to resist. And again, I do not believe this is be entirely based on the competency of the Russian military. Again, you are seeing two industrialized nations fighting a major war, and this is what it looks like. Again, Ukrainians are very well trained, have been uh, fairly well equipped uh, both recently and in the not-too-distant recent uh, as well. Uh, by both uh, training and uh, the uh, the delivery of, uh, of of NATO assets, and and again the intelligence hearing is a huge issue that people really don't understand in terms of what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, but again, the uh, status quo kind of remains. We have not seen the Russians, uh, what I would say, uh, uh, have uh, in terms of regaining any sort of momentum and rapidly gaining territory. That could change in the future uh, where we could start to see the, the Ukrainian military start to uh, collapse uh, as it continues to take casualties. And again, as you watch some of Western media, you would think that only the Russians are taking casualties. Only the Russians' equipment is being captured. But that is not the case. The Ukrainians are taking horrendous losses, especially with the use of this Russian artillery and tactical aircraft that are being employed. Uh, but a lot of this is not being talked about in terms of both the uh, casualties and the equipment losses that the uh, Ukrainians are s sustaining. Again, this is a uh, propaganda war as well, and uh, the, uh, the West is trying to do everything in its capacity to make you, the viewer, believe that, uh, in fact, the uh, Ukraine, is, Ukraine is, is winning this conflict. And uh, there are certain aspects where the Ukrainians are doing very well, and then there's other aspects where they're not doing so well. And uh, again, only time will really tell how this will really resolve itself. Again, very concerned about the possibility that this could expand. 
and bring in other nation states in direct confrontation with uh, the uh, the Russian Federation that could result into a, a, a much more far-reaching conflict really kind of all over the uh, the globe and that includes China as well you have to watch that very very closely in terms of what China is doing uh, as well but uh, I've kind of gone around the map and you guys can really clearly see kind of what's going on uh, especially difficult in, in Donetsk you would think that uh, uh, the separatist forces uh, in conjunction with Russian forces would have may have secured uh, after 20 days of fighting the uh, the Donetsk region but that hasn't uh, occurred yet uh, the uh, the Ukrainians are still holding fast in the uh, uh, northwestern quadrant of Donetsk and are still fighting in uh, Mariupol as well Mariupol is still besieged by the Russians and uh, continue to fight the Russians uh, for control over that uh, fairly uh, large city. Uh, now, uh, with that being said, uh, uh, Luhansk is uh, relatively under the control of the Russians, with the exception of uh, this town here, uh, Severodonetsk. Again, now, as you see this picture that, that came up on the screen, you can see the urbanization and the, uh, the, the large uh, urban settlements that uh, the the Russians have to uh, deal with, and again, the Ukrainians are u utilizing these areas as defensive readouts and resisting the Russians. Again, uh, those apartment buildings you see there, uh, very very well built uh, Soviet uh, era architecture. Again, utilizing uh, long range anti tank guided weapon systems from those structures. Uh, stingers and other uh, air defense assets being employed again uh, this is what is causing uh, the uh, the Russians to have to take time and seal these cities off and then bring in artillery to reduce uh, some of those targets that we're seeing but again incredibly nasty conflict the only area really where I think the Russians have done fairly well is uh, is coming out of Crimea uh, obviously, uh, much uh, greater gains have been made, but uh, until recently, we, we've started to see even those gains in the south uh, facing fairly stiff resistance by the Ukrainians. And again, this is very much an active conflict with some very, very heavy, heavy fighting uh, taking place really all over the country. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Obviously, uh, more to come very, very soon as we continue to uh, cover this conflict uh, each and, and every day. Have a good day, everybody.